Cool. Um, so we'll move on to our main presentation for today. Our featured speaker is Dr. Alvaro Romero, who is an associate professor of urban entomology at New Mexico State University State. in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Uh, Alvaro has a doctor of veterinary medicine degree from the National University of Columbia, a master's in veterinary entomology from Kansas State University, and a PhD in urban entomology from the University of Kentucky. He conducted his postdoctoral studies at North Carolina State University, and Alvaro's urban entomology lab addresses medically and economically important pests in the southwest of the USA, including bed bugs, scorpions, Turkestan cockroaches, and kissing bugs. Today, Alvaro will present on the history of and management strategies for bed bugs, including global resurgence trends, infestation risk factors, and targeted IPM strategies. He will also cover the U.S. expansion of Turkestan cockroach populations, traditional methods for cockroach control, and IPM strategies, including prospective repellents and insecticide-based paints. I'll pass it over to you, Alvaro. Thank you, Shoa. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, can you hear me well, everybody? Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, all right. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about bed bugs. I have been working with bed bugs for the last 19 years. And now, like Shoa said, I'm in New Mexico State University. So I'm going to be showing information on bed bugs in the last 20 that have been presented in the last 20 years and also finding from my laboratory um, but all in the concept of integrated pest management and trying to show what is new so it's a updated information that has been collected in in the last years uh, going to conference and talking to people so you are going to have uh, recent information on bed bug management here um, this is the outline. I want to talk a little bit about the history of bed bugs and how this recent resurgence has happened. Um, I'll be talking about bed bugs, why we consider bed bug as, as the perfect storm. I'm going to uh, give reasons about why, why we have to consider this, this pest as unique pest. And this is pretty much uh, based on the way the bed bug behaves. So I'll be showing some cases and situations where definitely you are going to notice that bed bug behave different and we, we need to deal with them differently. Talk a little bit about inspection that I was asked to talk. I think that's going to be very important. The last update. Insecticide, of course, there is a component of the program for uh, bed bug management. I'll be talking about synthetic insecticides, botanical insecticides, and biological. As you can imagine, there are many things that, that I have to say about bed bug, but I'm going to try to summarize the most important findings. And also, I'm going to end up with the IPM program, something that we encourage to do for the effective management of bed bugs. Let's talk about bed bugs because actually, bed bugs is our old enemy. It's an old enemy. A hundred years ago, bed bug was a, 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 a very important problem. And actually, it was many difficulties to control bed bugs like we're having in the last 10 years. And this picture represents what people felt during that time about bed bug control. Literally, they considered this like a, like a really a fight, a battle with bed bugs because they were very difficult to control. They were not very effective insecticides for bed bug management, and those insecticides, including cyanide gas, that was extremely toxic. So they were some tool, but they were toxic to humans. So that that's something that uh, uh, people felt during that time. It was really difficult. There was no effective and safe insecticide. But that time, DDT changed the, the situation, and that was in the 40, 50 decade. That's considered the golden area of pesticide with the discovery of DDT. DDT, that was a very powerful insecticide with a very good residual action. That's something that we want from insecticides. There was very liberal application. Look at these, these people, this person here. I don't know you see the arrow literally soaking this mattress with a, a DDT solution. This mom is uh, spraying aerosol, and here is the baby. And DDT was very important 
for the control of many ectoparasites, even those that vector diseases like mosquitoes, ticks, and, and then primary was a, a game changer in this case with DDT. Population of bed bugs by that time decreased dramatically during the following decades. After DDT, carbamates, organophosphates, and some other insecticides came out. So that was pretty much the reason why in many parts of the world, we didn't see very much, especially in developed countries, we didn't see very much infestation of bed bugs. Here in the States, in Europe and Australia, there were decades in which we didn't see bed bugs. They were small pockets, but they were pretty much controlled. Well, the situation changed at the beginning of this century. We started seeing infestation of bed bugs popping out everywhere. And this map pretty much represents, this is not an updated map because imagine, and this is a, probably this is more crowded with red points now, but pretty much represent, or I want to represent that this is a global pest. And interestingly, this happened at the same time, pretty much everywhere, something that it was amazing. And I say here that it's a forgotten pest because again, we didn't have this pest for many decades. So scientists forgot about this pest. I wouldn't do research on this pest. And that was extremely important, uh, critical, because when infestation started to show up, we didn't have, we didn't know very much about bed bugs. We didn't know what kind of insecticides could be used. We, we didn't know what kind of method we could use. So that was a real challenge. And we're talking about the beginning of this century. That is why today we consider bed bugs as the most challenging urban pests to control. I'm talking about indoor pests. Where bed bugs had show up? Well, initially it was in the metropolitan large cities, in, in high scale hotels and apartment buildings, in residences, and, and, and in different type of the, uh, facilities, the health facilities, university dorms, in those places that uh, in, in those places that uh, uh, have a uh, used furniture or they they use all these uh, materials you know they recycle these materials or like mattresses box print in the in the subway in in new york has been reported bed bugs also in laundry machines and laundry machine areas that's uh, other important places theaters and also libraries what I want to say today is pretty much bed bug infestations have been reported literally, literally everywhere. So we are vulnerable to get infestation of bed bugs today, particularly in certain regions of the country, big cities. That's a problem. That's something that we need to consider. This is not just happening in hotels, it's happening in certain places that potentially we can get bed bugs from pretty much everywhere. And this, this is the result of a survey from 2018 18, and represent the situation of bed bugs in the United States. Almost 100%, almost everybody reported in 2018, that was right before the pandemic, that they treated for bed bugs. So you notice how important, how frequent uh, pest control people encounter bed bug infestation and has to, has to treat. Almost 70% reported that bed bug service work was increasing. Again, this is before the pandemic. We don't know exactly what happened and how things are evolving after pandemic time, but I'm pretty sure that bed bugs are there and, and, and you had the people have to deal with these things. Also, in this survey, people were asked what was the most difficult pest to control and not the 60%, almost 60% of them, say that it the most difficult. Still, we have ants, cockroaches, rodent, termites, but the difference here is that for these other pests, we had effective tools. We had, ba we had primarily baits, and we had those technologies that can be used. In bed bugs, we don't have those. We still have to rely on liquid spray and some other things, and you are gonna see that we are having difficulties to control bed bugs, and that's why people is reporting uh, that bed bugs uh, is a big problem. In the next slide, I'm going to present a reason about why we should consider bed bugs the perfect storm. I don't want, I do not want to alarm people, but I want people to get aware that this is a special pest and we need to consider, 
we, we need to consider this uh, an a special pet because uh, it's extremely difficult and you're going to see why. Look, bed bugs is today the only blood sucking parasite living in beds. Of course, that's something that there's nothing similar. All right. So we have to deal with a pet that is biting and feeding our customers in the bed, the most intimate place that we have today. And we had to deal with that. We had to deal with a customer who is afraid, freak out because of the presence of this parasite, this ectoparasite, which is going to come out at night and bite. And that, of course, is going to have psychological implications for many. And this is a very important impact. And I consider the psychological impact of bed bugs un underestimated. This is a very important that we need to consider this thing. Also, it's challenging because this, this insect is small. The adults uh, measure a quarter inch, the adults. But you see here, the small nymph, the eggs are extremely small. Notice here in this picture, this is the head, or this is the, the, the pin head. They are very small. This nymph, they can hide pretty much anywhere they they feed can feed at very small cell places and remember that many of these uh, these bed bugs are going to lay the eggs in crevices and cracks and there are plenty of those places in in the house and in residences in the rooms i also want to show here the the, the nymph uh, bed bug has five nymphal stages and everybody here see okay so that's something important to mention. Look at this second instar, how small they can be. So challenging. Sometimes it's extremely difficult. I would say impossible to find them because they are very small and there are places where we don't have access to see them. They are excellent hitch hikers. And this is very important for those who serve, especially in severe infestation places severe infested places, because they have the ability, they have tarsi, the appendages here, to hang on things that we take in infested places, like this camera case. That was a camera case, and that was a bed bug after we visited a place infested, heavily infested with bed bugs in Cincinnati. This shoe, that was a shoe that people, the, the person regularly used, and they were bed bug here. This is a, a, a shoe sole, and with an imp here. And this is pretty much the way they we move around bed bug. See these use mattresses. Potentially these mattresses can be infested with bed bugs. So they had this ability. They had excellent hitchhiker and that's the way we move around bed bugs. Now when the bed bugs are introduced in the rooms, they had the head in there. They had there are many there are plenty of places to hide, given the small size, a quarter inch, very flat. They can fit in many places around these uh, around these areas. Very important to mention here that behind the headboard is a very common place where they locate because there is not very much uh, light there, and also generally these these headboards are made of wood, and this type of substrate wood. They love this substrate. So one point here I want to make that when we do inspe inspections, uh, it's very important to see behind the headboard. If we can pull off that head uh, headboard from the wall, that, that will be very important. I know sometimes that doesn't happen. There's pretty much a lock or glue or, or screw to the wall. But I think the, this is one of the places that we minimum we have to look for. They can also be in the baseboard. We, it can be in a nice stand. In chair. So there are many places in the, in the structure of the bed, in the box free, in the mattress. We need to look actively this this uh, this bed bug. We need to learn how the the sign of infestation, how bed bug look like, fecal spot, molds, all these kind of things that tell us that there is a, a infestation in that place. Now they are not using the bed; they are called bed bugs. But survey has then demonstrated that. Yes, 70% are in the mattress, box prints, and frame if you add this white area, red and green. But happen that often, especially in severe infestations, we, we will be able to see bed bugs in couches, in nightstand walls, in other rooms. 
that originally the customer reported, they can be everywhere. Remember that we are moving around the house, people are moving between rooms and all that. So the take home message here is that we need to check, we need to make an inspection, not just the beds or other items like furniture, chairs, um, sofas, all these kinds of things. Look at this picture that show and little nymph there, said, if you don't pull, if you don't remove that cover dust, that's covered, you are not going to be able to see that nymph. So we need that. We need definitely to think where they can be, uh, uh, try to find those those insects in all these tiny places. You have to have very good flashlight and you have to have patience to find them, of course. Look at this frame with those bed boxes. You don't, you don't pull that flap, you are not going to see those bed box lying there, right there. It's a bed box and there's a second bug here. Well, inspection is very critical. We should spend the, more or less that we say around two hours, or hopefully two people, because you need to disassemble the bed. You need to do a thorough inspection of this material. Recliners, that's also important. This is a recliner infested with bed bugs. This individual was spending most of the day watching TV and we didn't find bed bugs in his, on his bed. But then we check this the, this chair, and there were bed bugs here. Bed bugs are close to the hole. They tend to be close to the hole. That is important. We need to add the customer. Where do you spend most of the time? And then we we should check those areas. Electric outlets. We need to remove this thing because this is a place that they like it, of course, because they can hide in there. There is not very much dark, and we we should know how to treat these places. We cannot put liquid spray there. We have to use dust, and and there are several dust. I'm going to be talking about dust for this specific place because dust are a very important chemical tool that we can use on uh, for bed bug control. Wickers. This is an ornament here, and this is something important during inspection. We have to see. We have to spend literally everything. This is an ornament, a basket thing there, but then a close up. There were bed bugs and they're viable. L look at the response of these eggs. So these are viable bed bugs. They are going to hatch and half of them are going to be male and half of them female and they will feed. And they will, if we miss these eggs, we're not doing very much because these, these bugs are going to be, that's going to be, they're going to be growing and they will reestablish. The, the infestation. That's very important. This purse, if you do purse, uh, this purse has bed bugs. If you do a close up, eggs, females, and nymphs, we gotta do something with this purse. We need to, to do something with this purse because if we don't treat this purse, we are not doing very much. We, we might kill most of the population, but, but we're missing this individual, and that's gonna be a reason for a callback. That's it. And it's relatively easy when when we 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 encounter severe infestations. But happens that I hope you agree with me. Most of the infestations of bed bugs are light infestations, and they are very challenging to find. And this is a really a, a difficult. That's why we recommend a very thorough inspection with a very good flashlight, two people, and checking different items. And not just the bed, or like couches and all this kind of thing. This is a challenge. This is a challenge, definitely. Another challenge, especially in those buildings when they are heavily infested, you know, when we are called, for example, in this red spot, this represent there's an infestation, and we are called, well, you need to do the service check and all that, but also you need to check above, below, on the sides of this, because it's there's a good chance that bed bugs, especially in severe infestations, they spread to other adjacent rooms. 20% of the time, bed bugs are found there, and we need to be able to get access to those places and check if they have bed bugs. That's extremely important to do. Let's talk about uh, bite reaction, because this is something that many people are talking about, bed bug reaction. I, uh, my wife is beaten uh, and react to a, a bite. My wife is uh, my wife is beaten by bed bugs, but bed bugs do not bite me. I hear that a lot. 
But let's see what we know about bite reaction. And I should tell that bite bite reaction rea varies with the individual. But notice this statistics show that about 40% of individuals do not react to the bite. So people can have infestations, and because these, these bugs come out at night, you might not see them, and you might not see uh, skin reactions, and you might not be aware that you have an infestation. That's a problem. That's a big problem. Okay? 40% do not react. I do not react to a bed on bites. That's the reality. And 40% of people the same. The other thing, bite reaction is they are not different from other bite reaction of other arthropods for fleas, for mosquitoes. I cannot tell this is a bed bug bite. That's something that, you know, if you are responsible, uh, you are, you know, many physicians try to say that, that, you know, that this is a bed bug bite. You have to have evidence, you have to find evidence because again, you cannot distinguish this bite reaction from other uh, biting insects. So, in a regular service, <clears throat> when, when we go to these places and people complain and suspect that they had bed bug, we need to start asking questions like, wake up with new bites? Perhaps this person didn't have this bite last night, but wake up. That might give us a, a tips that there is an infestation. We need to ask whether they are traveling lately. That's going to give information about the introduction. When was the introduction? We need to ask if, if they had acquired used furniture. That is extremely very important. If they were overnight visitors, that also is something that helps us to uh, make an accurate uh, diagnosis of the infestation. Of course, we need to do the inspection, but these questions are very important to ask. Regarding this inspection, a definitely visual inspection like this person is doing, there is the most common method to find bed bugs. That's, that's something that we know and people are using. Again, there are some moments where literally we cannot detect bed bugs. There is no access. They are hidden there and we don't see them. Now, have been developed some interceptors. This is a, some sort of, sort of plate that are put under the bed legs. And, and this is taken advantage of the inability of the bed box to climb more surfaces. So bed box that crawl and trying to find a hole, they fall in these wells and they don't escape. That's an option that has been used, especially in low income housing. They are inexpensive and they are effective tool at detecting and monitoring pre and post treatments. Okay, and these interceptors have been used not used under the bed leg. It can be positioned in several areas of the bed, and they they are they can be very important in certain environment. Of course, you cannot put this in a hotel room, but I think that has been used successfully. A Dr. Changlu one has demonstrated that they are very good, especially for detecting detecting, uh, of course, monitoring uh, post treatment uh, in as well. It has been demonstrated that these interceptors are more effective than visual inspection. The ideal will be to do a visual inspection and also use these interceptors. That would be great. Has been <clears throat> have been demonstrated that that you deployed a number of these traps in a room might eliminate a small infestation, but we don't we should not, not expect to eliminate high infestations with these interceptor dogs. Also has been training, and there is an industry there, especially in a specific environment, very complex environment, like hotels, theaters, multi-unit housing, and has been demonstrated that they can be good, but researchers have found that there is a very high variation in the efficacy of these dogs to detect. There are many false positives, false negatives. So it's very important, if you want to use dog, you need to find a certified company which have demonstrated that do these dogs are extremely effective. I think that's going to be very important. So, but again, primarily we rely on direct inspection of bed bugs and also these interceptors. One other challenge that we have for bed bug control is that most severe infestations 
occur among socially disadvantaged uh, households. That's something that we know, and these places, unfortunately, they don't have very much budget, and there is some social behavior. There, there are many things that, that make uh, management, management of bed bugs in cells is extremely difficult. And now in this environment, of course, it's gonna be more challenging. People don't want to report infestations, there is not very much money for pest control and social behavior of residents. All these things can affect the success of program. And that's something and problem, an ongoing problem. And unfortunately, these situations have made that these places have be, uh, became reservoir of bed bugs for the society. And this is a reality. We see the severest infestation of bed bugs in these places. Low report infestations, and that the primary reason, well, the, the important reason here is that many people physically cannot detect infestation. General, they might be in a wheelchair, they might not see, you know. So this is something that that, that is a problem because they are not going to be able to see bed bugs and report that can happen. Many of them are reluctant to report infestation. Perhaps the pest control company the, were there, but they didn't do a good job, things like that. So that's something they, they get tired of that. They don't want to report more because the last time they came, I didn't do anything. And I, I still see in bed, but this is the kind of thing that we hear. Clutter interferes with detection and control. This is definitely something that happens. And imagine, in situations like this, bed bugs can be literally anywhere. So this is this is a big problem, especially for detection. It, it's going to be really difficult to try to find bed bugs here, and also will be difficult to treat this place. And in this environment, you have to know what to do with each item because you should consider each item as potentially infested with bed bugs. These are the most challenging environments. And we need to take care pretty much of every of this item if we want to eradicate bed bugs from these places. No big problem. You can do a good job, but happens that the residents the next day reintroduce the bed bugs, brought up uh, infested furniture and mattress things. We need to educate people. We need to establish programs. We need to say, okay, they need to report when they are introducing this kind of material. What we can do? Can we get a hit? a heat chamber to, to treat this material before they get into the, the, the room. That's something that we need to consider. Lack of awareness about bed bugs among residents, as that has to do with education. People need to know how bed bugs look like. People need to know, housekeepers need to know how to check the bed, how to, so in that way, residents too. So in that way, they need to know, you know, that that they, they bring a uh, used furniture, they need to check with the before, in the, you know, all these kinds of things are gonna be very important because uh, this is education, this is integrated pest management. Integrated pest management involves educating people, especially again about a particular pest like bed box. Limited budget for pest control. And there is unfortunately, you know, <clears throat> that's a big problem. Um, there's not very much money, and this, uh, the, there's an efficient pest management practices because of limitation of, of budget to control this problem, right? Often, there are treatment failures, and this, this happens. And it's, it's, not very, it's not very uncommon to see bed bugs resting on surfaces that we didn't know that they were treated two weeks ago. And you see that a bed bug resting in a plate that it was treated, you should suspect that the treatment is not working, the insecticide is not working, and you should suspect of resistance. And this is something that we, we notice. But it's very common to see treatment failures. Generally, the average or number of treatments to, to have bed bugs under control is around three. But sometimes this can be more than three, but that's the average. So this is very common. Having said that, we need to consider many other reasons for treatment failure. Perhaps we miss some bed bugs during the inspection and we don't treat them. That's an option. Clutter, as I mentioned, is also an important reason. So in this particular environment, it will be difficult to find bugs. Reintroduction, you did a good job, but happened that the residents 
brain, brain infested furniture. And also, of course, it can be some insecticide issues. I've been working in insecticide resistance almost in the last 20 years, and we have shown that, that many populations have developed insecticide resistance to many of the insecticides we are using today. And that's something that is, is, is expected because most of the insecticides, most of the insecticides you are using to control bed bugs are based on pyrethroids and neonicotinoids. They are the most common. These red arrows are the most common pyrethroids, and these blue neonicotinoids. So notice that pretty much we are using two active ingredients. By using two active ingredients and not having very many alternatives to control bed bugs is problematic because that select population for resistance. And we know that, and we have reported that, that they have been resistant. This is not happening just here in the United States, also happening globally in Australia, in Spain, in all Europe. 90% of the populations have been shown to, to be resistant to pyrethroids, have the genes, the mutation that allow them to be resistant. Again, this is being reported everywhere in Australia and many other places. So resistance is a concern. Of course, we have to do something to, to, to make more effective this uh, management of bed bugs because, again, we're seeing a lot of issues with with resistance. Again, suspect about tolerant resistance when you see bed bugs resting on previous 3D surfaces. So this is an alert. And you have to do something. You should not keep treating this place with the same population, with the same insecticide formulation, because but it giving sign that this is no signal that this is not working. And now Typically, we say, okay, squish to a different active ingredient. Fortunately, we don't have very many active ingredients for bed bug control. We cannot apply DDT, carbamate, organophosphates indoors, and there are some other compounds like pyrrols, IGRs, you know, but there are not very many options. That's a big problem. Like, you know, in many other agricultural pests that we might have many, no, and I, I should not go that far with, let's say, cockroaches. In the case of baits, there are some, some aversion to some base in cockroaches, but in, in the case of cockroaches, there are different active ingredients that we can select from. In the case of bed bugs, we cannot afford having that. We don't have very many options. That's why management of bed bugs relying only on chemical is very problematic because of insecticide resistance. Now, I would like to talk about insecticide dust because I think it's a very good option. These insecticide dust are particles that can attach, can be picked up by the insect, and, and the most effective ones are those which contain the silicon dioxide. Those are desiccants. And important thing here with this dust is that they, they can maintain the effectiveness as residual deposits for months of years. So there's something that you put in there and can last for years and can kill those bugs that come across this deposit. So let's let not forget about insecticides. But we need to know where to apply these insecticides. We cannot put this right away on the bed, on the mattress, because you know that the bottom line here is that you have to follow the label, the label, the label instructions. And we need to know how to how to apply this, we need to have the right equipment. So in that way, we, we don't have problems with this, the poisoning and all this kind of situation. So there are tools that they can use and can help to control bed bone infestations. I need to talk about diatomaceous earth because that's something that people ask me. They say diatomaceous earth, this is good, eco-friendly. You know, people like this thing with diatomaceous earth. We had doing research, a lot of research in the lab, and we had noticed that diatomaceous earth, for me, is not the first option. Look at this bed bug feed, bed bug that is covered with diatomaceous earth. And this bed bug is feeding on a human four days after exposure to diatomaceous earth. Do you think diatomaceous is working? That was four days. Two weeks later, it still was alive, this bed bug and still feeding on a human. 
is not this evidence that diatomaceous air probably not the best option for bed bug control. So we need to think about this and, you know, because that's a big problem. That's a big problem. People are using diatomaceous air and some other insecticide that we know that they don't work. Over the counter insecticide that we find out there, they do not work for bed bugs. We had to have special chemistry. We need to have other chemicals, other insecticides. So all these materials are based on pyrethroids, and we know that pyrethroids, the population had developed resistance to pyrethroids. Those do-it-yourself methods worsen the problem. What about foggers? People ask me about foggers. Foggers are terrible for bed bug control. They do not work against bed bugs. They do not work against cockroaches, kill few few bugs because these materials are based on pyrethroids and also in reality what they can do is scatter, spread bed bugs around. Also can be very dangerous for people. It can cause fires and all these kind of things. So don't use foggers, don't recommend foggers because they are not going to work. I was asked about botanical based insecticide for this talk and has been a good alternative and there is, there is a list here of botanical or, or essential oils, right, that has been tried and there are different formulations here. And actually it's a mix of essential oils in many times. And the summary of this is that when you spray bed bugs directly with these essential oils, they have good contact activity. Whatever you hit, you kill it. And I think that's something that we expect from that. Also, the, look, these are, there are three it was published for Dr. For Dr. Uh, for, uh, Dr. Chang Lu Wang lab in 2014, and there were three: Eco Rider, Bed Bug Patrol, Bed Bug Bully. Those three cause those three cause a, a high mortality as direct spray in the lab. These are laboratory studies, and then they were wondering about dry residues, how effective dry residues they were, and they found that Eco Rider and Bed Bug Patrol have effect when they were when the bed bugs were exposed to dry residues. So this is something that they show in the lab that when this deposit this deposit of insecticide dry is effective. That's something which is, is, is very important. I was also asked about simic shield. This is a soybean oil and I don't this data I took this data from the internet from the Department of Entomology in Purdue, and they had shown that, that the residues of this material kill bed bugs, even age residues up to three months. That was done again by the by a depart the, by the Department of Entomology in Purdue, and this is data that they show. So this is another alternative that they have. This is mortality whether these materials are repelling and all that, well, there is not very much information about that. Because, of course, having a um, product that kills and has repellent activity, that would be great. Also, I was asked to talk about uh, Aprehane, which is a, is a formulation that includes a fungus, Bovaria vaciana, and the, the principle of this is that the spore of the fungus attached to the cuticle of the insect and it penetrates the cuticle and they invade the, the body of the insect and in the lab have been demonstrated that cause mortality. You see here, uh, literally invaded bed bugs with, with these fungus and killing uh, uh, the insect. That's something that they have demonstrated in the lab and they, are, uh, they recommend to use these materials in places in in all places where bed bugs can be, they recommend special equipment to apply this material. So it does something again that uh, helps to to control bed bugs, can control a system. That's what they claim: control system bed bug infestation. They claim also that if you put barriers or you spray around the bed, these barriers remain effective for up to three months. That's something. Unfortunately, we don't have yet field study, but I'm pretty sure some of you have been working with, with this product and probably you had a lot to say about this material. But that, again, this is a, an option, an option for management of bed bugs. Having said that, and collecting all the information that we have on 
control of the box in fuel condition. Many fuel fuel lower, fuel studies have been done in the United States in the last two decades. This is a this is a clear statement. It's very difficult to eradicate pet bugs using only one control method. Based on what I had said, because there are some difficulties with insecticide resistance, we don't find them easily. They hide and they are reintroduced. And there are many of these issues that we cannot say, you know, okay, I'm going to use this and I'm going to eradicate. That's not has been demonstrated and there is data, field data to show this. That's why we need to go back to a concept of integrated pest management for bed bugs. We need to embrace this concept. We need to have clear that we need to do something else. Sanitation is going to be very important because this reduce by reducing all this clutter, you know, around the places where bed bugs are. That's that's going to be important to find the bed bugs and also to treat bed bugs. So we need to remove all these items. Nothing should be under the bed. That's a big mistake. Vacuuming is a no chemical that helps to remove all those individuals. It, it even can remove some eggs and live insects. That's something that we can use. Also, when there is an infestation in the bed, it makes sense to use encasements. Encasements are covers that pretty much these encasements are going to trap all those bugs that are already in the structure of the box print or the mattress. And the insect is not going to be able to bite through the fabric. So that's going to be very important. Also, denies the inner access of those bed bugs, new bed bugs, because a box print is the heaven for bed bugs. There are many crevices. It's made of wood. So imagine, if we cover this thing, we're going to reduce the chance that they get inside or those that were inside get trapped. Steaming, many many of you use steaming, excellent. Their bed bug is extremely sensitive to heat. So an steamer, an industrial steaming is gonna help because it's gonna kill right away. Heat work better than cold, and the heat chambers put things in the dryer. Here in, the, in New Mexico, it's extremely hot. It has been recommended to put some of these potentially infested items in plastic bags and put outside in the summer. Um, well, hoping that, you know, that the high temperatures kill, but of course we gotta be careful not to put too many things in the bag. But I think heat is extremely important. Also structural heat treatment and fumigation, it's a big industry with that. Of course, it's gonna be more expensive, but this is one of the best methods to eradicate bed bugs in a place, of course, it has to be, it's a good technology, and but it requires preparation, and it needs definitely a help from the residents to be able, again, to do this really well and, and, and kill all the individuals. I want to finish my presentation with it because I think it's going to be extremely important. IPM, we always talk about IPM, our chemicals are no chemicals, but in, in the case of many urban pests, especially in bed bugs, we need to educate people, we need to educate the staff, we need to uh, educate landlords about identification, biology bio control prevention. This is something that we need to emphasize if we want to be more effective at controlling this pest. I finished with this slide and I don't know how much we are with time, but very happy to, to try to answer your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Alvaro. We're at about 1025 right now. So I think that we can address a few bed bug related questions before you transition over to cockroaches. Uh, is there anyone who would like to ask a question on what we've heard so far? Yes, George, I see you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, so um, I know with the, the unhoused situation, a lot of times we take in their um, belongings and hold them if there's like a police activity or something. Uh, what are the chances of us, you know, vectoring those bed bugs if we put them in a 30 day, 90 day hold area? And what would be the best method to store something like that? You know, because I guess the rules are that we have to hold their items for them. So, you know, what's what's the best way to store unknown items? 
Oof, that is a very important question, and and all is gonna depend. All is gonna depend on the temperature. It's gonna depend where we're gonna put these uh, materials. Yes, we we might recommend to put these in plastic bins, some materials, and leave in there. But look, we do know that bed bugs stand long periods without feeding. Starvation is something critical. It's very important for them. So, if it's, it's really hard to tell you, okay, one month, two months, three months, because again, it depends on the humidity, it depends on the temperature, you know. So, oh, I have ventured to say probably six months, but look, you can do something with that. You can, you can do, for example, things that you can put in the dryer, you can do it. If you cannot put things in the dryer, you can use uh, these in, uh, insecticide strips that are based on dichlorbos, you know, those materials can be used, you know, and in the case of potentially infested items, and you can put those strips which is going to release the insecticide, and that, that might be an option. But again, uh, oh, we can do something, something like that, and uh, I would say that it, it requires a few months to start the bed bugs. But again, bed bugs surprise us. Have been reports that bed bugs are still alive after one more than one more, more than one year without feeding. So, so again, yeah, more than one year, literally. So it depends on many, many, many things and and and. And giving a time frame to say how long this that that's really difficult. But I would say it's gonna be months before they die. That so, information. So about what I'm hearing is is that we almost got to treat that material we bring in prior to storing it. Is that kind of? If, if we want to use that material soon, I definitely will do it. You, again, try to see you can put this thing in the dryer. Be ten minutes in the regular. A cycle of the the dryer that that will be, and then you you can reuse this material. If there is something that you cannot put in the dryer, yeah, you have to consume. Yeah, that's that's not gonna happen. Like I said, a lot of the times the majority of the stuff we're getting is their personal belongings that'll be like in garbage bags or in backpacks or in suitcases. Uh, the officers usually just collect them and bring them to a, a storage facility where they keep evidence. And like I said, my concern has been that I've noticed that in some of the bags, because I've asked them to um, put them in a big garbage bag and tie the garbage bag off because we were having problems with gnats because the officers don't go through or search the um, backpacks or their belongings. They just, you know, confiscate them and hold them and give them a, a receipt. So that's kind of problematic. So, you know, with that being said, you know, is there a better way? You know, I'm thinking maybe we, you know, designate a spot. I mean, is heat an issue? If we had a super hot room to put them in, would that be helpful? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's something that, you know, that many people are doing using these heat chambers. And now there are some heat chambers that are not very expensive, you know. Uh, again, bed bugs are extremely sensitive to temperature, and that would be a, a very good option in those cases. I think that in in places where the infestation infestation of bed bugs are very high in those buildings and all that, I think worth getting one of these heat chambers, you know. And again, it can be used for for in the case you are saying that this bag clothing and all this kind of thing. But also, if it's possible to establish a policy a policy when people wants to bring bring in. A furniture and all used furniture or you know all this kind of thing those things can be that heat chamber and you will take care of that problem and also you don't confiscate this thing for a long time and you can treat this material if possible again we have to deal with many things especially you know it's human behavior i know it's challenging but i think that that will be a good option heat chamber mm -hmm. okay all right. Well, thank you. I noticed one of the participants asked, "What you know? What do we consider hot? What so? What temperature is that? That hundred twenty or above? One hundred twenty-five, one hundred okay. that, that that's a good temperature. Fifty-five Celsius degree. That's a good temperature for about an hour. Also, I didn't mention about uh, cold, low temperatures. Uh huh. 
uh, and that's also another option. Of course, they need to they need to stay in in, in freezing conditions, uh, probably at least 24 hours. That's an option, but again, you have to have a freezer, and right. that, that's not very common. You you okay. you don't want to use the freezer from from your house to put these things, and you need to okay. big spaces. But again, that's that is an option if the freezer is a big freezer is available, eh? gotcha, and you can gotcha. put that material in in low temperatures. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. Well, thank you, thank you, Alvaro. My pleasure, George. Uh, Alvaro, can I ask about how long is your cockroach presentation? It's gonna be about the same, forty five minutes. Why? We. Won't have that much time. I see that there are some great questions coming through now. Um, would it be okay with you if we continue some Q and A and discussion on bed bugs, and then maybe you could do like a highlights of the cockroach presentation with the remaining time? Would that work for you? How long? How long we have for the cockroach talk? It'll probably be. My guess is maybe fifteen minutes. Okay. That's fine. Okay, great. Thanks for your flexibility there. Um, we do um, have a comment in the chat um, regarding like the personal protective equipment and the sort of behavior of the technicians and some of the photos you shared. So um, there was a comment that some of the photos showed the technicians didn't have gloves on and uh, were leaning on the furniture. So could you maybe speak to um, some of the best practices for the technicians Ab visiting absolutely. the tested site. There are some protocols, uh, and definitely uh, there is some. So, and we need to learn that, of course, because in those severe infestation uh, places, uh, it's very important to have to, for example, not to put items and belongings, you know, on sofas, on mattresses, no sitting, you know. That is critical to have like a box, uh, like a plastic box or something where we can. Keep this item there. That's going to be important. Gloves, of course, going to be important. You want uh, face masks because you are going to be manipulated and there is dust everywhere around. There are some things that can be plastic things can be put in, on the boots or the shoes. That's a that's critical. But again, we I think the most important thing here is to to reduce a contact of these personal belongings that we bring in. In, in all those places where are potentially infested. I think that's going to be, be aware that a, any place can have bed bugs and anything that you put on and anything that potentially can potentially get infested. Great, thanks. Matthew, I see you have your hand up. I had a question about what we talk about bed bugs a lot in terms of like where we find them in an infestation and then we can introduce them into a new habitat by moving them right the hitchhike uh, phenomenon but i was wondering what is the original habitat of a bed bug say before we had like huge metropolitan areas and what sort of i guess regions or environments do they prefer like in in nature that they came to us originally? That's a very important question. I think that have been a, a scientist report that they they evolved from from bad bad bugs from the caves. You know, that's something that evolutionary process has been demonstrated that many of these bugs live, you know, in caves, you know, in caves. And you know, humans, humans and uh, millions of years ago uh, use those caves during that time and there was an adaptation and there was a new host there and then there was a switch of hosts from bats to humans and then when humans left those places and settled in cities or in town world well, they brought bed bugs with with all these personal belongings that's the history but you, if you ask me about a, before the resurgence of bed bugs that we have seen the last 20 years, I should say that in reality, particularly in the United States, they were remained in pockets of bed bugs in the United States. They were not totally eradicated. Happened that they were, they were in some specific. That's why we speculate that there were some pockets of bed bugs in the United States that 
probably nobody noticed because they were easy to control and they are report of bed bugs in the 90s, in the 80s, but again, there was not a big problem. And the other option, and that now there's coming out molecular work that demonstrate that many of the bed bug population we have in the United States has been introduced from Europe and from Asia and all these kind of things. So we had to go back with the hitchhiking ability and we can move these, these bed bugs in a matter of hours if we are in a plane and we can go to Japan and, and take an infestation. I don't know if that, Matthew, answers your question. Yes, no, it does. And I, um, I'm fascinated by this conversation and by your whole presentation. So thank you very much. It's my pleasure, Matt. Have a good day. All right. Uh, earlier, I think I saw Luis's hand up. Did you have a question? I want to give you an opportunity to pipe up if you do. Uh, hi, Alvaro. I love your... Oh. Hi, Alfredo. I love your presentation. Uh, so good to see you uh, here participating with us. Um, I wanted to ask you about, um, uh, well, you brought up the freezer, so I'm happy that you did because that was another uh, option for treatment. Uh, you had mentioned um, the use of the uh, fumigation uh, tablets or the dichlorovos uh, for treating bagged items. Are you familiar at all with the Circle product, uh, the neem oil that has a similar fumigation uh, aspect on its label where you can use it to treat um, containerized belongings and clutter? No, I I had read some paper from Asia about the use of neem oil. And I know neem oil is, is has many properties, but and but if I remember, yeah, they 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 have they have killing effect it can cause mortality and also repellency but i understand the use of neem oil is problematic because they can be very expensive to to get those materials okay yeah that's what i understand from neem i work with neems neem oils in but in south america uh, working with, with with pigs and and yeah definitely you know all these are essential oils they have many chemicals in there and the good thing about these chemicals, uh, this essential oil is that the insect is attacked by many, many chemicals, you know. So insecticide resistance is very unlikely when we use essential oils. What we need definitely to improve is the residuality of the essential oils. All the essential oils I, I mentioned, they have. And there is a paper that have, they was reported, I think, a uh, couple of years ago that demonstrate that these essential oils kill resistant bed bugs. So it, it was a, an important finding. So we have alternative, okay? We need to use it, of course, we need to use, but we need to identify those essential oils that definitely are effective. Right. Yeah, thank you uh, for that. Because we are, you know, especially in this group, very interested in those reduced risk uh, materials uh, that are going to be effective, of course. Um, I did share in the chat that product Circil uh, it's a it's 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 a labeled product for um, that has neem as an active ingredient for fumigating inside of bags in that way. Uh, it's something that might be interesting. I'm also really interested in the Apprehend product that you mentioned earlier. Uh, it is something that we have some experience with um, use, but it, you you really have uh, shared at different presentations that it is uh, uh, shown to be very effective. Um, I just have some questions on how we should be evaluating the risk of the product. Uh, I you know, I have concerns uh, using it indoors, especially here in San Francisco, where we have uh, immunocompromised uh, individuals that are living in these spaces, where we don't have any central AC or central heat, and we're in a very humid environment. Do you think um, we should have concerns about the use of uh, entomopathogenic fungi in this way, in this location? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question that come out very often. And I think that uh, that's something that um, needs to be addressed by a toxicologist, you know, because yeah. uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, the government, when when this product was the true re registration, they had to show data that there was a minimum impact. But again, uh, uh, it's hard to tell, you know, it's hard right. to tell these things. Of course, it's a, it's a fungus, you know, and this is going to be an indoor environment. 
but again, uh, there is something difficult to demonstrate, and I uh, I'm pretty sure the this product pass the standards for safety issues of EPA, and I I'm not saying that it's not gonna be potentially toxic for for some people, you know. But again, uh, I am entomologists and and giving an opinion on this topic. I think that that's something that doesn't correspond. It has to be a toxicologist and uh, uh, clinics and you know in that yeah, way fair enough. and try to design uh, to see how how people can measure the impact of this on humans and because yeah there are many preconditions there of course that that might be something important to consider but again in my position in entomology is i i i cannot answer that question yes understood thanks right. again thank you so much my pleasure and as a toxicologist, I can see how I can help you out there, Luis. Uh, Thanks, sure. Uh, Brian, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, watching your presentation, which was very, very good, uh, I keep thinking about different places where we could pick up bed bugs. And so I was thinking about air travel. So the uh, question is, uh, have you seen or have you heard reports of how prevalent uh, bed bug infestations are at airports and on airplanes? Because I think about like you're going through the security checkpoint and people are have all these bags and clothing that you have to take off your jacket and you're shoving it into these bins and it's getting all squished together. You know, the one place where, you know, if you have bed bugs that are hitchhiking, on a bag, as you've shown, getting dislodged or crawling from one bag to another, and also overhead bins under the seats on the airplane, and then the cargo hold, uh, all the luggage is just being piled up and squished together. So uh, have you seen or experienced that? Hi, Brian. Uh, good morning. Absolutely. And look, there is a, I remember I, there was a meeting in Hawaii in October and, and last year, at the beginning of the year, they reported bed bugs in the Hawaii airport. They reported bed bugs and also in transportation means in the trains, for example, this is very common in China. In China, you know, uh, trains are, are extremely important, extremely important uh, move of, um, people move around and they had big problem with bed bugs also in Europe and they in those trains you know they are they, they, they're very very many things going on now to know the frequency how often that is of course it's going to be very difficult to know Brian but it's definitely a way to move around bed bugs and also to acquire infestations how common that can be well I think that's it's going to be very extremely difficult but but again all these in that i want to say that that we need to be alert of that when you are traveling even though you you don't have the box it's good to check your bag you your luggage <laughs> your bags you know because yeah potentially they can be there i mean probably it's, it's unlikely it's gonna depend on many things but that happened has been reported but we don't know in reality the number because that's going to be difficult to to find out. Yeah, it's thinking uh, every time I travel now just to check all the luggage and that that one picture that you showed of the bed bug nymph on the soles of the shoe that was pretty eye opening. And I see in the chat somebody said they caught a bed bug on Bart last month. Yikes. Um, for you, Alvaro, BART is our public transit system here in the Bay oh. Area. Um, there's also a comment in the chat that there's a product by MGK called Crossfire, where the active ingredient is clothianidin, which is a neonicotinoid insecticide um, that this person uses uh, for bed bugs in hotel settings with some success. Yeah, I think that this I know I know this product and it's that's as a neonicotinoid, but also has a pyrethroid and had a PBO. This is uh, something that we used to inhibit all these enzymes that are involved with insecticide resistance. And I had heard 
from other researchers, you know that this is this 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 is one of the products that that is working out there. Uh, this is a good mixture, and and people are using it definitely a uh, crossfire. But again, there are some other products there that uh, can be used, but this is a uh, exactly there is a metal metal flutrin. This, yeah, this is a pyrethroid and piperonyl butoxide. So they are incorporating. They are incorpor incorporating that uh, synergies. So um, yeah, that that can be a good option for bevo control. Okay, and Matthew, I see you have your hand up. Is that an old hand from before or a new question? Sorry, that's an old one. I'll I'll lower it. All right, great. Um. We've got another question here. Uh, what's the impact of indoor neonicotinoid application on pollinator species? The impact of this insecticide in a, in a, a spray that is used indoors, uh, in my opinion, is minimal because we are using these insecticides to control bed bugs, which is, is an indoor pest. We are using these in mattresses, box prints around the room. And it's very unlikely that these pollinators encounter this insecticide because they live outside. Perhaps this, this applied to some other insecticide that you use around homes to control cockroaches and all this kind of thing. I see there a problem, but in an indoor pet like bed box, I don't see how. Yeah, that would be my guess too, is that it's as long as the application is limited to where the infestation is and all indoors, that it, the impact on pollinator species outdoors would be minimal. Other questions or comments from folks related to the bed bug presentation? You can feel free to raise your hand or type it into the chat. Yeah, Brian. Hi again. Uh, somebody mentioned, or you mentioned bat bugs. So I was wondering, uh, in your experience, uh, have you come across other species of Cymex besides Latularius, like uh, tropical bed bugs, uh, bat bugs, and swallow bugs? That's a good question, Brian. Uh, even in here in New Mexico State University, last year we dealt with a bad bug infestation, and and they were, you know, when these bad bugs leave these places, they in the buildings, <laughs> they they need to find an alternative host, and the alternative host is our humans, you know, and and they are sometimes they are very challenging to control because of the places to get access to those places where they are living. So, but I think that in these cases, uh, insecticide does might work. How often? No, it's not very often to see these cases. Uh, um, in the case of bad bugs, we come across once in a while, and we know to know how to treat them, of course. But it's very important to, in these cases, to distinguish the species, you know, and then that way we we know we're trying to find them. Generally, they are in the roof and all these areas in the bad nets. Regarding tropical bed bugs, tropical bed bugs is not very common here in the United States. It has been reported in Hawaii and in Florida. And there are some cases, I'm pretty sure there are some tropical bed bugs that we haven't detected, but because there's a lot of traveling from places that we do know are severe infestations of bed bugs. We have been doing a study on resist, insect resistance from bed bugs from Hong Kong, and all they had there is tropical bed bugs. We also collected some bed bugs in Medellin, Colombia, and that was a tropical bed bug, and genetically was identical to the bed bug we got in Hong Kong. So they are not common. We use pretty much the same tools, a uh, tool that we use for control the common bed bug for controlling tropical bed bugs, but definitely I think they are around. Uh, how likely is that they establish, they, they become predominant? 
I don't know because again, these these tropical bed bugs say uh, they are more, they they do better, they thrive better in tropical and subtropical uh, environments. I don't know if that answered your question, Brian. Good. Um, I'll ask a question too, um, Alvaro. I think it might be best to just leave the discussion at the bed bugs and maybe we can invite you to talk about cockroaches another time because I don't I want to give that the time it deserves. Um, so my question for you has to do with situations where folks are living in, you know, multi housing units or high density homes, right, um, which is a great way to um, lower environmental impact, but you have all these neighbors next to you who where there might be construction going on or you know you you can't control what's going on in your neighbor's home so if there's a bed bug source that's coming from elsewhere in a multi-unit um multi-home dwelling what would be some of your suggestions for trying to make sure that everyone in the building is practicing best bed bug prevention behaviors sure education we need to we need to tell people we need to tell people that people uh, the bed bugs are all around. We need to to promote those practices of our reporting. Uh, they need to know how bed bugs look like. I think that's going to be very important. Co communication in at, at all levels. I think that, that that's critical. If those places that try to ignore the problem and that that's worse because because those things are not going to go away. They have plenty of holes all the time in these high density areas and 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 they are literally these bugs having blood all the time. They're going to become machines to produce eggs and to produce babies. So the best thing is to to encourage people to report infestations to they need to know how to identify them and all these things uh, I, are going to be very important to to try to reduce the impact is it's, it's really tough, I know, because it has to do with education, but I think that there are several protocols that have been proposed for this kind of environments, and I think our task is to implement them and try to adopt them depending on our circumstances and also our logistics, but people need to get educated on this thing. Mm -hmm. Do you Do you and your team put together educational materials? Yes, uh, well, I was involved with a with a USDA grant uh, like three, four years ago with Dr. Andrew Sutherland from San Francisco, and and we collected, we compiled all the information on bed bugs, and it's an excellent website uh, that people can consult. So, and um, for the especially all that information generated in the southwest, in the south, yeah, south, in the west, on the west of the United States. There are many resources there. I can share that that link. Um, yes, please. If you could put that link into the chat, um, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Right. I can. I can. I can answer. I can answer questions while I find it. There's no problem. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. We can take a couple more questions and then um, you can uh, type it into the chat afterwards. Um, and I saw that. Uh, we got a comment that San Francisco Department of Public Health has rules for adjacent room inspections. Uh, we have a question about if there are any beneficial insects that feed on bed bugs or bed bug eggs or larvae. Um, very incidental cases, you know. Um, there is a report on ants that feed on bed bugs. Uh, spider, you know, but yeah, I mean, they're they're predators, you know. There are many insects that they are generalists. They don't discriminate. They find something that is moving and look like an insect, and they are gonna ingest. And definitely, yeah, some wabs. I have been seeing some wabs and also ants. I think, but I think that we need to frame this question in, from the practical perspective, in the sense that, listen. I, I, I put on a slide about people being afraid of having insects in the bed. So it doesn't have any practicality to try to use biological control agents or predators 
in indoors environment because people are not going to like it. How I'm going to justify, hey, I had a spider which is predator of bed bugs and well, do you, do you mind if I leave? That? That's not going to happen. That's something, you know, in, from the practical perspective is, is, is literally, you know, this environment is zero tolerance to many of these arthropods. So yeah, there is some report, but it, in a sense, doesn't have any practical use. I have the link here. Uh, let me, how I, okay. I'm going to put the link of the website. That would be great. Right there. So you're going to find, you're going to find a good information about protocols in different, uh, how to treat in different environments, in hospitals, what to do in all these uh, environment in offices, in theaters, and all the, this bunch of information is published and is, is free, of course. That's something that you definitely need to consult. Okay, great. Thanks so much for sharing this resource with us. So for folks in the audience, Oliver just put in the chat, the link to the Western IPM bed bug work group website that you can have as a resource. Um, we do have a question about um, cockroaches. How long does a cockroach live? Depend on the species, but it might last probably, probably in general. I mean, we say Turkish and cockroaches, one, one and a half year. I depend on the resources, nutritional resources, depending on, on, on many of these. Uh, the temperature is going to be very important, humidity. So uh, it's, it's, it's something that um, varies depending on the conditions where the cockroach is. Thanks for that. Um, earlier in the presentation, we had a question come through about uh, the botanicals. That There was a slide that you shared, Alvaro. Um, I wonder if you might also include in the chat some of the botanicals for bed bugs that have been shown to have some efficacy. Um, you want me to share the screen again? Yeah, you could also just go back to the slide and hold that up for a minute or so. Okay. And folks can take a look at it. Uh, okay. And are you seeing the, my slider? Yeah, we are. Okay, perfect. So. These are, again, this is part of a study, if not my study, but I think that here you see those that are in red boxes or those are botanical-based uh, insecticides um, with the direct uh, application, it, it killed it kill bed bug at least 60%. So and that was evaluated 10 days post-treatment. That's for direct spray. It could write the bed bug patrol and bed bug bully. Direct sprays, you know, there are many, there are many insecticides, you know, that it, even alcohol, hot water, that can kill bed bugs. I'm not recommending alcohol because it can be flammable and that that, that can be uh, it can be dangerous, you know, but what I'm saying is that there are many things that uh, if we hit directly, we kill it. Uh, but remember that bed bugs are they bore, bed bugs are, are very capable of hiding in many places and they are not totally exposed when we go and see them. So that's something that happens. So that's why we, in the case of bed bugs and many other insects, we need to have insecticides with residual action. So in that way, when the insects come out at night, they eventually encounter those deposits and pick up these materials. It can be liquid dry dry spray or dry residues from liquid sprays or insecticide dust. Great, thank you. And for folks um, who want to catch additional content on these slides, we do uh, post a recording of the featured presentation on our YouTube channel, so that um, if you want to go back to catch any content, you can do it that way too. Um, and I'll ask maybe Valerie to put, drop the link to the YouTube, to our YouTube channel into the chat when you have a moment. 
Um, there's, we'll take one more question before transitioning to our open peer-to-peer -peer discussion, which is, would you consider DDVP Vapona strips an effective method of controlling cockroaches and bed bugs on small items? Uh, honestly, I don't know very much about the use of this. Is. Probably somebody had tried, but with against cockroaches. But in the case of bed bugs, definitely. Um, they are they are effective. They release vapors, and they are extremely sensitive to these vapors of this DD, DDBB. I think that uh, uh, is for this particular product. It's very important to use the right right amount of the strips, depending on the area. You follow the label, the labels, and and you you don't pack all these bags or containers where we're going to be treating, I think you're going to have a very good chance at killing a bed box. They are, they are definitely effective and they have been used, but again, you need to know how to use them for bed box. In cockroaches, again, no, I'm, no, I'm not familiar with that literature. Okay. Great. Well, at this point, let's wrap up this portion of our meeting. Thank you so much, Alvaro, for sharing this really information-packed presentation on bed bugs with us and for the leading this really rich discussion. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to talk about cockroaches, but I'd love to invite you back um, to have a, a special, you know, cockroach session with us. Um, so I'll ask everyone to join me in giving Alvaro a round of virtual applause. Really appreciate your time and all the information you've shared with us.